thank you for inviting me to to the conference, to the uh, School Leadership and Sustainability Conference 2021. Um, I want to ask you to help me in thanking the organizers for, first of all, having given me the privilege of being able to speak at this conference, but also for their patience and understanding. Um, it's been an incredible journey, I guess, for them, trying to reach me, getting me uh, uh, settled and committing to the date and all that. Not because I'm extremely busy, but because I'm not as organized as I should be. So hopefully my New Year's resolution is to do better. And I think I've learned a bit from this, uh, from this brief interaction. When I was first in, um, in put in touch with the organizers, we, we had a big, a little discussion, let me say a little discussion around what exactly it is I want to take out of this conference. And a little bit of a discussion as well around the people who will be attending the conference and what they expected to get from that conference itself. And uh, out of that came a decision that we would probably just want to raise issues. And in the course of raising those issues, we would then have an opportunity for us to, um, an opportunity for us to explore some of the ideas that I have, um, some of the ideas that I've, I have seen elsewhere, and some of the things that I, I believe are germane to the discussion. As is always the case, um, when I stand in front of a microphone, I tend to lose myself. And uh, I know that we have time constraints. You're not only here to listen to me, there are many other very exciting speakers that will come after me. So let me try to conclude my work, which is to deliver the keynotes, set the stage, and present some of the issues that are out there. I just thought I should warn you that, that, that parts of this presentation were publicly exposed about 17 years ago. And they're still quite radical, which is quite unfortunate. That the things that we discussed 17, 15, 20, 30 years, 15, 15, 20 years ago, are still pretty much the same things that we're doing today. That's a little bit of a challenge, but I, I suppose as we go along, you'll start to see what it is that, uh, why this is the case. So my, my company, I'm the CEO of Infographics, uh, a company that I founded, I co-founded with a friend in 1994. At the time when we set out to build this company, um, I was coming out of an, a career in advertising and decided that I wanted to do something more in technology because of my initial exposure to tech. When we came together, we, 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 in 1994, to set up the company, we, um, we said to ourselves that the internet, as, as we know it, went commercial in 1993 with the launch of Netscape Navigator, which was the first time that the average person who didn't have any technology skills could go online, quote unquote, to the internet and browse. I don't know how many pages or sites there were then on the internet back, back then, but um, those who are old enough, those who, I had more hair back then, of course, but um, those who, 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 are, who maybe read history or who were around as well around that time would also know that this was when things actually started to happen in the technology space. We, in Nigeria, we're asking ourselves, so, you know, what really is it? Because back in those days, we used to go to a cyber cafe to go and check your email. And um, um, you, 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 they, were not like, they were not like laptops. We were building our computers from, from, uh, from um, components that we used to buy in Surulere. And, uh, you know, you get, the, you get the box, the casing, you buy the board, you buy the RAM, you buy everything and put it together. And that was even for a, a, a few people. Because back then, in 1994, a computer cost about 250,000 naira. And this was at a time when the dollar was something like about 40 or 50 to 1. So you really needed to have a lot of resources to build computers. And, and here we were saying that we wanted to be part, and wanted to be part of a global um, movement. But we believed that everything that could possibly be digital would be. Every single thing. And we knew that the only limits to digitalization had to do with the human body itself and how you'd be able to transform physical things into digital devices or digital um, experiences. And one of the first things that came to mind was education. We were convinced that, that education had to go in the direction of digital, and we started very early. So our first clients, strangely enough, in 1996, um, that allowed us to build something that appeared to be e-learning in 1996 was the Nigerian army. Um, 
think about it. 1996, internet fresh, and somebody in the army says, I want to do this. We thought that we were on the road to somewhere. It turned out that we were on the road to nowhere. 20 years went by, 30 years have gone by, and we're still at the same place that we were um, back then when we said we wanted to get new things done. So part of the challenge for a, um, I think part of the big challenges for, um, for young people today is the impatience that they obviously feel, and with good cause, uh, the impatience that they feel towards um, um, change and the pace of change. If you're an educator, you would know that when you go into a classroom, you're, it's almost like you're, you're aware that you're going to be obsolete and you're teaching the people who would make you, in turn, who will make you obsolete. And you know that 10 years, 20 years from now, they're going to be looking back at you and just saying, well, that person was such a Neanderthal. That's what the, the, the teachers, um, the teachers uh, kind of like the teachers, I, I would say reward in a way is that the teacher is in the present and building towards the future. The entirety of education and education experience is about a future that has already come and gone. Because even as you teach and as you educate and as you expose, you're knowing that these people are leaving you behind and that you will always become the person who has to play catch up. And playing catch up is not just once or twice, it's playing catch up all the time. You're constantly running and racing and yet the kids are staying, they're moving away from you faster and faster. With that, it creates a very interesting dynamic that you have to commit to saying to yourself, they will know more than I will, they will be better than I am, they will grow faster and they'll go to places that I would never even dream of going. How then do you as a teacher infuse that dream in a child? You don't. What you do is that you awaken the dream. That's what a teacher does, opens up the child to the possibilities of their full potential. But beyond that, you can do very little else because every child has a dream within, within him. Every child is born with a gift and with a promise and with a purpose. And the role of the educator is to enable that child get there himself or herself, not to do so on their behalf. Um, I'm sorry, the slides aren't moving as they're supposed to, so um, those who are online may not. Uh... In that process, we did find, as, uh, as, uh, as, as we found as a person, that's what teachers tend to find as well. What did we find? We found, I found this quotation that kind of like captures what it is that our experience has been from 1996 to date. And it says that at every crossroad on the road that leads to the future, each progressive spirit is opposed by a thousand men appointed to guard the past. It always seems whenever you want to go into the future that there's somebody who's trying to pull you back. Somebody who tells you it's impossible. Somebody who prevents you from doing the things that you need to do to, take, to make that future a reality. And I think every single teacher, every single person who's involved in the education sector faces this challenge. And that challenge is that this is one of the most conservative sectors in, in, in the entire economic system. And yet it is, the, it is the same sector that is responsible for creating the possibilities of the future. And in there you find an immediate conundrum that you are required to think of how you can enable people to discover their future. And at the same time, you're operating in a sector that wants to keep things the same all the time. Well, we found a way out as an organization. It took us nearly 10 years. But we found a way forward. And when we took off that, on that journey, we became within the space of, uh, by 2004, um, Infographics was the leading company in, um, in, in Africa for the delivery of a certain type of technology. We built everything that we did around young people. We started taking children into our, into our organization from the age of 13, 14. We stayed with them through their university career and we employed them even afterwards. And we found that we were right, that we could, anything that we wanted to do, we could. All we needed to do was to put these people in place. So in some ways, I was already a teacher. I was educating, but I was educating within the construct of a corporate organization. And that led me to start to ask the question, what was happening in the public sector in the real formal place where people were actually teaching and learning? And that was the beginning of a journey that I, I am on till, till today. Yes, we won awards. One day, I found myself on a stage in Boston at the Microsoft Worldwide Partners Conference, and I was the only, we were the only company in Africa 
um, on that stage. I was so overwhelmed. I had a tiny little Nigeria flag. I didn't even know what to do or say. And I had, I had no way of expressing my utter bewilderment that I was standing in a hall on top of a stage with Bill Gates. Um, and I was being recognized for outstanding achievements. And my organization was being recognized for outstanding achievements coming out of Africa. Mark the dates, 2004. Ten years after the internet had exploded internationally, coming out of the U.S., in Little Lagos in Nigeria, a company made up of young people committed to realizing what we saw as our future, we had succeeded and we had been internationally recognized. Um, the companies that surrounded me at the time were companies like HP, Accenture, I mean, global organizations that were truly, truly fantastic. And somewhere in the midst of that was Little Infographics. It told me that if we insisted that we could get whatever it was that we wanted. If we committed, we could get whatever it was that we wanted. And so I started to look aggressively in the, at the education sector to say, okay, if we could do this ourselves within our organization, how do we make this possible through the public sector of education? And that experiment or that, that trajectory or that story or that mandate, that commitment created one of the most traumatic experiences that I have been through in my entire life. And that was seeing a system crumble before your very eyes and not be able to do anything about it. The disaster that was Nigeria's education system didn't happen overnight. Back in 1996, 1994, we put together a story. And that story you can see on the screen. We believed that it was possible if we infused technology into an education environment that we could create a truly connected learning environment, a place where every individual could be the best that they could be. We recognized very, very early that the power of the, of the computer didn't lie in the computer itself. It lay in the individual's ability to utilize that tool to create things for themselves. And we also knew that through the computer, an unimaginable, unimaginable um, uh, capacity was there for you to visualize a future that was possible, to carry out calculations, to do things that were previously unheard of. I grew up in the time when we used slide rules, and the guys who had the slide rules were the biggest and the best guys in the school. We had these guys we used to call uh, mama physics, you know? So if you were in secondary school and you were doing advanced mathematics, mathematics and physics, you were literally a god in the school. And when you come out, you carry your little slide rule and you're moving around, everybody's like staring at you and they're giving you space because they know that you are more than anybody else in the school. This was, a, this, was, this was the way that we were. And suddenly we saw this thing that had the capacity to bring that same power to create, to express, to build new to every single individual. And we tried to sell this idea. We struggled and we struggled and we struggled. And ultimately it became... A story of less. We realized as we went on that this truth that was self-evident to people like John F. Kennedy, that the goal of education is the advancement of knowledge and dissemination of truth, was a story that was being told in those countries and was powering those countries. But in Nigeria, we were mouthing the words but not living the reality. Something happened to the country between the 1970s and 1980s. And whatever it was that happened, which till today I do not yet know, it began a precipitous decline to where we are today. And yet every step along the road, as we will see in the slides, in the slides uh, um, that, that come, uh, come forward, every step of the way, we kept finding that people were reluctant to accept this as a reality. No. What we preferred to do, apparently, was to tell ourselves a lie. Rather than focus on the truth and say to ourselves, there's a challenge that is before us, everybody came together and kept telling lies. And, if, and so long as we continue to tell the lie, we continue to undermine ourselves as, an, as, as a country. We found repeatedly that organizations and countries and, and uh, people who were in positions that needed to, to um, um, influence things insisted insisted that all was well, even as the system was crumbling around them. They kept telling these stories that all was well, there was no problem, 
they threatened, and ultimately the beneficiaries of education eventually became the victims of the system. I'll come back to that in about five minutes. But let me tell you a story of what happens when you decide that you want to be different. Because it's important for you as you're listening and as you're watching to understand that it is possible to do things if you make up your mind to get it done. So I want to take us to Cross River State, where we had a governor who, who, who understood that there was a problem and an opportunity that lay in the education. And he decided that he was going to put up an education strategy because Cross River State at the time had lost all its oil wells. It sits at the outer edge of, uh, of, um, of Nigeria. Used to be, is the only state in the, in the Niger Delta that doesn't have oil wells. And so they decided that they were going to, they couldn't depend on, on allocations coming from the federal government. And they were going to build an economy. And that economy that they were going to build was based, was going to be based on certain things. It was going to be a services-based economy. After that decision was made, soon after the decision was made, the governor, I had the good fortune of meeting with the governor. And we had a discussion and he asked me to join the state in thinking through his strategy because he said, there is no way we're going to do this without technology. So I sat down for a period for almost two years, working closely with the, with the people in the Ministry of Education, thinking about what does education, what is the role of education in this state? We came to the conclusion that education was not only an enabler of the services economy that the state was building, but it was also a massive opportunity for a state as an industry in itself. And so Cross River was then set up um, with the ambition and the aspiration to be the source of human capital in Nigeria in very specific areas. And we laid out a plan and we started to execute that plan. In the course of executing that plan, we learned a lot about ourselves. I'm sorry, the slides are maybe a little bit small for most of you to see. But we, we, we learned a lot of things around ourselves. We also traveled abroad and went to see things for ourselves, what was happening in other places. I'll help you read them out. But we set up a very basic thing, that in every, every senatorial district, we're going to have a reference school. And the reference school was going to be a school that, 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 that was a public school, affordable by public standards, but it would have international outcomes. We agreed that we we're going to set up school hubs, and we set up 60 school hubs as, as clusters for training and for building human capacity and for the continuous development of teachers. We agreed that we we're going to establish computer labs in every single school. We agreed on what was now the cross river standard for a school, in which every single school would have four labs one for, one for biology, one for chemistry, one for physics, and one for ICT. We also transformed that ICT lab into a training center for, 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 for teachers and for students so that there will be continuous professional development even inside the school environment. We went beyond that and understood that the teachers were the heart of the system. That rather than be threatened by the system, by the introduction of technology, we could enhance them by creating, giving them capacity. And so that we came to an agreement. After talking to the unions, after talking to the teachers, after speaking to the parents, we all agreed and a date was set that by a certain year, I think that year was 2015, 100% of the teachers in the, in the education system and 100% of the regulators in the education system will be digitally literate. Because digital literacy is what enables you to participate in this. I remember going to one conference and we're talking about Encyclopedia Britannica and they talked and talked about Encyclopedia Britannica. Then I reached into my pocket and brought out a CD-ROM and I said, what, do you know what this is? They said, Nasidi. I said, yeah, but it's not music. I said, they said, Nasidi. I said, I said, the entirety of Encyclopedia Britannica is on this one CD room. I almost didn't leave that village because they mobbed me. They all insisted that they had to have it. I said, if I give it to you now, where are you going to play it? They said, uh, what do you need to play? I said, it's computer. You have to get your own computer. Long and short, we went through this process with Cross River States. And eventually, we built out a full program for digital literacy curriculum across all 17 local government areas. We identified a minimum of 22,000 teachers that needed to be trained. But beyond training them, we also agreed that every teacher, the best way for a teacher to learn, to become digitally literate and start to use the, use the computer was to own it themselves. So we built an ownership program in combination with the school. And we achieved within our first phase, over 12,000 teachers were trained in their local governments who went to where they were. And as you can see from the image on the screen, 
In some cases, our teams who went for training had to go in boats with canoes and small generators into villages to train them in their location. You see, if you want to train a teacher and you bring the teacher to the city and train a teacher in digital literacy, then the, then the teacher goes back to the village. What do you think is going to happen? Whatever it was that they learned becomes pure theory. The only way that we could make it real was to go into their environments and in situ show them that this technology could actually work. So within the space, the space of one year, Cross River States achieved the highest geographic distribution of, 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 uh, of computers in any state in the entire country. Unlike having computers in the state capital, now the, the computers were in the hands of teachers in the villages where they were actually teaching. We put together a complete system, preloaded them with all the software that they required, all the training that they required, and then we went to go and stay with them. But in each of the places that we went to, we also built internal capacity so that within the schools, within the ICT labs, in those 60 hubs, each of those 60 hubs was specially was planned based on a on GIS mapping to ensure that there was a that there was a technology resource person available to you within 10 kilometers of wherever you were. So we achieved that distribution to ensure that we would have that technical support. We embedded these people in the schools and we took the math teachers math teachers and we turned them into ICT trainers. We put them on a, on, a, on, a, on a roadmap to acquire technical skills and qualifications so that they themselves would understand that as they are learning, they're also enhancing themselves and becoming more available. Indeed, our biggest fear was that after training, these teachers would abandon Cross River and go elsewhere. I will give kudos to the governor at the time, Senator Lea Limoke, for having the commitment to double down on the incentives that were going to teach us to keep them within the system and to keep them continuously engaged in the schools that they were in. You will be amazed. Every single computer that went out was paid for by the teachers themselves. We created a payment plan with insurance around it and every single one of those, those 12,000 teachers who were in the first batch, every single one of them paid for the systems and owned it themselves. And we found, that after 40 hours of training, after just 40 hours of training with these, this, with these uh, teachers, 40 hours is, um, we're going in and we're running like uh, eight day training, five hours a day and that type of thing. And you can see from the pictures that are on the screen that these things were happening in situ. Like I said, we were not going, bringing them to anywhere. They were in, our, in their own environment and we're training them there. And uh, we will take a small 2K, 2K generator. This I passed my, I passed my neighbor generator. We put up in a, a, a small multimedia projector, a darkened room, we enter, we train. And you can see clearly from the pictures that these are the environments in which we trained. Remember what I said, that this, the, the, the government had already invested in upgrading the schools. So we had the labs in which to work in. And what is there in the lab? It's just the building, as you can see, with fans and tables. And then the teachers brought their own laptops and came into the environment. Why a laptop? Because a laptop has eight hours of power. I didn't need to put a 5 kVA generator to power anything and be struggling for where, where diesel would come from. The teachers will bring those laptops to school. And when they're in school, before they go, they put them into charging stations and they charge them, they take them back home. What did we find? We found that every, uh, uh, from our baseline tests and the subsequent uh, analysis on digital literacy training, we found that it was an incredible result. Teachers who started out, as you can see on the blue level, ended up at the red level. So 40 hours of training, they transformed themselves from having, from almost not knowing to completely knowing. And here was the big thing that we learned from it. And I'll give you an example. I hope I can play this video. Um, but I'll give you an example of, of what happened. They overcame their fear. And as they overcame their fear, they, certain things started to kick in. We found that they were able to build a community of learning amongst themselves. They started training themselves. But guess who became the chief instructor? In every household where the teacher had a laptop, the child became the chief instructor. For children as young as six years old, would open the devices and start to teach the parents how to use the devices. They, would, they, they saw it like a toy, the same way that they play with your phone. And they take these things and they start playing with it and they started teaching the teachers. 
But more, in, more interestingly, the incentive for um, having these laptops also changed. Not only did the teachers want to use them as we said they should use them, but more importantly, they wanted it to enable their children to pass their own exams. So we found that the, that the, that the what's in it for me, which we consider to be such a negative, is actually a positive. Um, maybe somebody can help me play that first video. I'm not sure I, I know how to get it done from here. I'm one of the facilitators for this program that you are coming for. My name is Mary Anya. Can I know you, please? My name is... You are welcome. Thank you. You are coming for a computer training. Yes. Can, when you heard about this training, how did you feel? When I heard about the training, I was very worried. Even when they started talking about collecting uh, computer, I was feeling bad because I felt that by this time, oh, what am I going to do with computer? Am I going to go back to become as a small person before I start learning computer or what? So I was feeling bad that instead of buying this computer, I could make my children. So when I was so worried. So as you have come for the training, what are you expecting? Now that I have. I have received the training. Very... Now that you have come for the training, what are you expecting? No, I am expecting that since I have already inside the training, I believe God must surely bring everything to pass. And I will understand whatever I will be taught. Because if I concentrate on what you are teaching me, surely I will get to see. Thank you. Yes, How was the training, ma'am? The training was very fantastic. I know that the first day I met you when you were coming, you were worried. Very Are you much. still worried about using the computer? Not at all. I'm feeling very okay now. Now I can challenge my children who have gone for training for some uh, uh, months. Now, for only one week, I'm able to boot and... Uh, um, boot and... Uh, use the computer today is loose and prowling, armed with weapons designed by the older generations. He is saturated with an understanding of power, its uses and abuses, possessed of a predisposition for intolerance and violence, and driven by a psyche riddled with an inferiority complex, cultural schizophrenia, and hypocritical values. He is obsessed with the rewards of sycophancy, ethnic chauvinism, fraud, and corruption. He is addicted to legislation of terrorism, naked power, sex, hemp, and hard drugs purveyed by the older generation. He is disgusted with the sterile catechism of patience, conservation, love, probity, hard work, and education that the older generation preached but perverted in practice. He is alone. He is frightened of tomorrow's promise and explosively dangerous in his cynicism. He does not give a damn about rewards in the hereafter. He wants his here and now in the reality of the present. The youth throughout this land have no more illusions, be they in primary, secondary, or tertiary institutions, in cities, towns, or villages, on the streets of Lagos, cattle trails of Borno, or forest parts of Uopi. They are the elite students of the same society that you and I are living in. He said, if we cannot recognize these traits in the generality of the youth around you, it is, if it's any comfort, you're not alone. The majority of the readers will dismiss these assertions as exaggerations. They need the safety and the comfort of disbelief, even as the idiot's bomb is being primed for detonation. Yet in our offices and homes, we harbor these leaders of tomorrow. These buccaneers who already aggregate themselves in ruthless gangs in all our institutions of learning, and they are proud of their strength and ridicule knowledge. In time, this ill-formed elite will acquire the veneer of success. And masquerading in suits and uniforms and abada of the older generation, they will control and articulate public policy to impact on all of our lives. 20 years later, who can say that this is not the situation? Net net, for 40 years, we have been refusing to accept our reality and deal with it constructively. The reality is that when financial systems fail, everybody battles to sort out the problem. When the banks were going to collapse, they battled. 
Every time that some sector of the economy is in trouble, people come to the table. But education has been in crisis for 40 years, and we have not assumed it to be the crisis that it is. And yet, it is education or miseducation that has resulted in a situation that we have today, where none of us lives in security, and all our children are asking themselves, what next, what next, what next? Why would we have created a society where people are looking to get out? Where for a young person, his future is obviously abroad. The reason is because they understand that education is a currency of the 21st century. And they are not getting it. human capital, not on the resources. In Every the nation competes on the And until you are able to grab that in the ground, that capital, and until you are able to grab that, it's it becomes that capital, that human capital, and develop it. It's it becomes the children know for you that a world class education. They are not fools. They know what happens. Their colleagues live here, end up in Canada and America, and in a couple of years, within a decade, we are talking about them as though they are amazing people. They all grew up in Lagos, in Ibadan, in Aba, in Kaduna. They all went to, we all, now all of us go to school now. She'll be the you day you did like before. How come every time our youth are extracted from this soil and replanted in foreign soil, they suddenly blossom and become massive? It's the reason is the fundamental issue. The education system. It creates the capacity, but it also builds the people who actually build the nation make it possible. So what do we do and how do we change our picture? Which is a central thing because Nigeria is heading to a stage where we're going to have 350 million people in this country. And we are battling an issue of over 45% unemployment in the, in the education space. We've been struggling for 40 years with a capacity system, a system that only has capacity for 14% of its children in senior secondary. The rest stop education at GS3 because there's no TVETs that is going on. The answer lies in technology. And I can say it over and over again, and people would say it's because I am in technology. But I will tell you the reasons why. If you look at the thing that you see on the, on, on the, uh, the image, the diagram that you see, there's something called the cloud economy. This is the global economy. It is where everybody has to be in the 21st century. And yet in Nigeria, it is the urban formal economy and professional elites who have true access to the cloud economy. The digital literates, as you can see, are off to the side, completely away from that bubble. The rural informal economy is completely off to the side. There is a, a small group of the education unemployed who can beg for the charge card, who are able to be part of this cloud economy. This is not possible for a 21st century environment. For us to be able to partake in the 21st century, we have to move that bubble and bring those bubbles in. And that's what you can now see on the screen. We need to bring in through the diffusion of technology, as many of the educated unemployed into the cloud economy so that they can then re-educate themselves, reskill and retool themselves to acquire the skills and the capacity. We need to bring in the invisible informal economy and make them part and parcel of this cloud economy. Anyone who sits outside this cloud economy is automatically being disenfranchised and perhaps even being condemned to a life that produces the kind of results and the kind of, the kind of uh, fracturing that we see inside our society today. And the people who have to do this, we no longer have to depend on the public sector to get it done. I'm trying to say, every teacher, every school proprietor needs to put on the armor of a reformer and take this battle as their own personal battle. We have no more room or no more time to wait for anyone. We have to do it ourselves. Whether we recognize it or not, the majority of, well, let's just call it, call it measurable quality education appears to be happening more and more in the private sector than in the public sector. In many states, over 50, 60 percent of the children who in basic education are in, are in private schools. So we have a responsibility. If we can change one child, let alone 60 percent of the children in any state, as our responsibility in the private sector, we have to do it. And my point is that we can do so affordably with greater impact by massively introducing technology. 
and this is how I want to learn and perhaps end. The opportunity for technology goes beyond the classroom. It goes into different dimensions. Yes, technology can provide differentiated instruction. Yes, it can increase feedback. Yes, it can provide visualization and simulation, for instance, of labs. For example, for over 40 years, we have been doing alternative to practical. This is a test that was put together because Nigeria recognized that some schools didn't have labs. Today, 40 years later, all schools do not have labs. People will say, I am being, I'm exaggerating. Well, you know, it's left for you. You tell me when you've seen a lab in a public, in a public school and I'll, I'll ask you to, just let me buy myself and yourself a ticket and we'll fly there together. Or we'll drive there together and let me go and see it. Is it okay for us to be in the 21st century anchored on STEM and we cannot say that the majority of our public schools have the infrastructure and the facilities required to teach STEM? And yet we want to be players in the 21st century. Alternative to practical, nobody has asked themselves over the past 40 years what has been the outcome, but it has become an easy way out. So instead of actually building labs, maintaining labs and teaching, they now say alternative to practical. How can a child understand chemistry if you've not had the magic of titration? You have not seen that magical moment when you just add just that one mm and suddenly the thing turns to brilliant uh, uh, blue. How can anyone tell you that, that a child who has never handled a set square, who's never handled a T-square, who's never worked on a lift, how can that person actually come into, into the magic that lies in science and love it? How do we send children into universities to study medicine who have never once done a dissection of a frog in situ? How? How can that child graduate from medical school? How can a child graduate from computer science when the first time they actually see a computer is when they have graduated and started work? What does technology do? It empowers our students to be producers of knowledge, not simply consumers of content. And how do we get there? We believe that there are three things that we must do. We must change policy. We must bring technology. But if we don't build capability and culture, it's all a waste of time. The policy can say what it wants. Nigeria has not lacked for deploying technology. But tell me, what has happened to all the knowledge access centers, all the big projects around deploying multimedia, um, magic, what they call that, a whiteboard, electronic whiteboard, what has happened to all of those things? They've all turned to dust. This country has been investing in technology and deploying technology and education. There isn't a single case study that any government agency can present today of successful deployment of technology with outcomes that are measurable. Not one. So we cannot wait for them. We have to take the responsibility onto our own and do it. And you look at three different areas where technology can impact. You need to look at the e-learning, which is a common component. But how much technology is actually being used in the administration and how much technology is being used in the management of the school itself? So when you look at those three, you can break it down into other sectors, other areas. And I, and I don't want to go into too much of this because I believe that the search for the answers has to come by you as an educator or a school proprietor getting deeply involved to understand this. Go back to school. Learn it, see it, experience it, and then you then customize it to your own environment. Otherwise, they, uh, what we've wanted and expected and hoped from government has not come, which is an artic a clear understanding of the role of technology, the clear building of capacity inside the system to utilize the technology, and the implementation of policies that empower people who use that technology. I told you about Crossura, a simple policy that said that every teacher was a digital illiterate by a certain year, propelled 12,000, that's 50% of the teachers immediately to put themselves on a track to, to, um, to upgrade and really, just that policy. And it wasn't a carrot, wasn't a stick only. 
The carrot was there. The carrot lay in the promotion and the continuous training that was, that was guaranteed to the teachers who actually met that, that thing, plus the certificates that they got. All of those teachers also took the Microsoft Digital Literacy exam and were, and were certified. So they had something that, so that certification guaranteed them certain benefits and promotion inside the system. And then you build the learning community. A single policy driven by somebody who has a clear and an honest intention can radically transform. As I conclude, let me just point to one example of where we are and where we need to be. This is a picture diagram that simply explains the kind of learning that we have been running. Standardized learning. On day one, first term, everybody comes to school, everybody sits in a class, a teacher is in front. They start teaching. They teach the curriculum and they run that curriculum irrespective of where the children are. In this group of classes, each of those children is going to proceed at a pace that is different from the other because that's what they are. You know, is it possible to say, I agree that my wife makes fantastic uh, fresh fish pepper soup, but it's not fantastic all the time. Unless she turns it into a factory, it's impossible. Quality can never be repeated every single case in every single time, every single day. Hence the need for differentiated learning. What do you do? This is the reality of the classroom that each of these children inside that room there, every one of those children has a certain disposition. And if we cannot empower the teacher to deal with each of these children on an individual basis, to work with that disposition, to enable the potential of this child, then what happens is that we get to the end of the session and we test, some pass, some do not do so well. We go to the next term. Regardless of whether that child who started on day one is still relative to his colleagues at 10% of the learning he should have achieved in that first term, that child goes to the second term. Carrying that 10% and is in a class with those who got 90% of the learning. And so we continue and we cycle them through. And then we wake up one day and we say, education has failed. How do we do this? By deploying technology. I believe that we have to have a way of massively deploying technology and we need to understand very clearly, as I have said many times before, connected learning is not the same thing as internet learning. You do not need the internet to create a connected learning environment. What you need is wide area networks or LANs that are basically video based and the content in your school. The last time I made this statement, I got like 10 calls. Show me how, tell me how. Please, I'm not a contractor in that way. I would like to make the money, but that's not what this is about. My, my company does this, and we've done it for, we did it with, for instance, really the MTN Foundation, 29 schools in eight states across the country. 12 states, sorry, 29 schools in 12 states across the country. We've done it for other people, but that's not the point. It shouldn't be about, can Chinaya do it for you? You should be able to do it yourself, and you must have somebody inside your institution who knows how to do it. That's the capacity that we have to build because we need to scale this at a level that no one individual can possibly do it. No one individual can have the contract. This is something that we all have to own. And as a school proprietor, if you do not know already what needs to be done, then it means that you too have failed. Three things that I want you to keep in mind. Always ask yourself, how can I increase the teacher's productivity? And what is the role of technology enabling the teacher in increase their productivity? What if I introduce technology that reduces the amount of time that a teacher uses to, to mark scripts? What if I can give my teachers back 30% of their time? Can they take that 30% of their time and turn that 30% to go and address the child who is at 10 when others are 30? Do extra classes have to happen after school when the teacher is free because I've given the teacher back 30% of her time? What if I can tell a teacher today how many people inside this class before us here have understood what I've said? 
And before I'm leaving the class, I can see clearly that Tunde gets it, America does it. What if that were possible? What does it take to make the teacher productive? Second question. Teachers, students don't learn in a vacuum. They learn through an extended ecosystem. How can technology enable the parent, the teacher, and the student to collaborate better? How does the parent know how well, supposing I know how well my child did in school every single day. Supposing I knew where the child needs help. Supposing I knew about his behavior in the school that day. And he didn't have to come to me as a report at the end of the term. What if we can intervene and have teachers and students and parents talking on a regular basis, aware of what is going on? What if we can enhance the parent, teacher, and student collaboration? What is the role for technology in doing so? And lastly, how can we improve visibility inside the classroom? In many public schools, teachers are in class, but there's no teaching going on. There's no real learning going on either. Some classes, the teachers are teaching, there's no learning. Some classes, the teachers are not even there. In the rural areas that I have been to, the teacher appears in class, and an hour later, the children are in the farm, farming. Some places we go to, the children are out on the street selling popcorn for the teacher in the streets, hawking. Some places we go to, the teacher is there, supposed to teach eight subjects and cannot even speak English. And is expected to teach the eight subjects. How do we know what is going on inside the classroom? How can we use technology to do so? And how do we then close the gaps? I can tell you, that a device that is teaching mathematics 100% correct, 100% of the time, available to a child, that that child can stop and rewind and play, and rewind and play, and rewind and play, will produce a better outcome at the end of the term than a teacher who is struggling to understand the subject matter himself or herself, because that's not his area of expertise. Education is our responsibility. It's everybody's responsibility. And I want to close by saying, let's find the courage. And as Nin says, life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. We are in the midst of a massive crisis. And if we don't arrest now, there will be nothing left within the next 10, 20 years. Because our, our population is increasing at such a rate that we don't even have the capacity to have met what was there in the past. And we're still telling each other lies and stories about school enrollment and whatever. We are creating urban centers with ungoverned spaces and ungovernable spaces, controlled by ruthless gangs who are basically illiterate, who do not see education as a pathway. We used to think it was happening in some part of the country. Now it's all over the country. There's no part of this country that you will not see young people. We have children being recruited in primary school into gangs. There's an understanding that this education that we tell them to go and do is about just going to a building and coming back and maybe bribing somebody to give you the mark. We already know as a child is entering school today that when he gets to GS3, only 14% of those will be able to go to senior secondary. What happens to the 86% who can't? We already know that our technical and vocational education system has collapsed and has long collapsed and has only a, a total enrollment of less than 1 million students across the entire country. We already know that our tertiary system is only graduating 450,000 people a year. That for a population of 200 million, we have less than 2 million students in tertiary education. That's 1% of our population. We already know that every year, between 100 and 
20 and 150,000 Nigerians migrate out of this country to other countries. And that those who migrate, as we can see from the visa programs, are the best that we have. They're all hunting for professionals. Nobody wants your ally. The only people who get visa are those who are at the top, who prove themselves to be good. They're the ones who get the visa. How can you be producing 450,000 and losing 150,000 every year? And the 150,000 that you're losing are the best of the 450,000. How can we have a society where every graduate, every young person's goal is to get to the point where he can apply for a visa and leave the country? He's not leaving the country to become an ally. He's leaving the country to do what? Get an education and fulfill himself. We must find the courage as educators to take on this battle. Let us no longer look to people who are outside and point at them and blame them. Let's assume that the fight is ours. And let us go to battle like true warriors that we are. I have never seen a teacher who doesn't have the heart of the warrior. But over the past 40 years, we have systematically drained them of their courage. We've made them feel that it cannot happen. And they too are giving up. Believe me, when the teachers give up, when the education system give up, when educators say we can no longer do it, all of us should pack out and go. I hope I've left you with a few things to think about and a few mandates to pick up and run with. I am with you, fighting this battle as best as I can. But believe me, we have to become an army, and an army for change, so that this generation that is coming into the 21st century with aspirations to be global citizens can feel that in this country, in this country, they can be all that they are meant to be. Thank you.